Hey, good morning. How are we doing? Hey, it's been a great day in God's house so far. Amen? Oh, man. Oh, I was just worshiping. Thank you, worship team. That was amazing. Um, hey, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible. And if you are visiting with us, and I know we have some visitors because I met a few of you uh, prior to the service, uh, thanks for joining us today for worship. We're glad that you're here. Um, we don't give bonus points when you get out on gloomy days, but it says a lot about you and your character. And so we're glad that uh, you have joined us for worship this morning. And we do hope that you'll let us know that you're here. We just simply want to be able to uh, connect with you. And uh, we promise not to stalk you or hang out on your front patio or, you know, whatever the case may be. We just want to send you some information uh, about the church. As we begin today, I'd suggest to you that everyone, <clears throat> and that means all of us, um, were born with this innate sense of justice. It's kind of like a spidey sense. It's like um, we have this extra measure, uh, this radar of awareness when um, somebody has experienced something that is uh, not fair or equitable. It might not always be dialed incorrectly, this radar, this spidey sense, but we all have a sense of what's just and what is right. And since it's true uh, that we were all born with this innate sense of justice, it also means something else. It also means that we have this natural bent and this inclination toward retaliation and revenge. We don't have to be taught this. Um, we, we naturally... Uh, respond with retaliation and revenge. I mean, we just know this to be true. We just, we just do this. Uh, in fact, um, right behind the sound booth here, like right out to these doors, is our nursery. And my guess is, is every single Sunday that we have nursery, there's some eight-month-olds, nine-month-olds, uh, maybe year-old, year-and-a-half-year-olds. And at some point this morning, there will be a showdown over a toy. There will be one child playing with a toy, and another child in another part of the room will look over and see said child playing with toy and see that that, cho that child is receiving joy and gratification from playing with said toy. And that child then will make a beeline over and go, well, if that uh, toy is bringing such joy and happiness to this child, I must play with it. And so they take it from that child, and then the child who has the toy taken away from them, what do they do? I mean, they can do lots of things. It's like multiple choice. They might start crying, right? They might bite. They might hit. Uh, they might just reach out and say, nah, -uh, not today, and take the toy right back. Adults, when you're driving on the highway, maybe you're on I-20 and you're headed towards Dallas, because who wants to go toward Louisiana? Am I right? Can I get an Amen. <laughs> And so as you're, I just speak the truth in love is all I'm saying. And so as you're driving on, on I-20 though, and someone like pulls up next to you and then, and then the next thing you know, you're going 75, 80 miles an hour and they cut over right in front of you. Um, your first inclination is not to go, oh, would you look at that? I mean, they must have really needed in this lane. I mean, you might give them a hand signal, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, just wave at them. Um, you, you might, if you're anything like me, you're like, oh, no, no, you did not just do that. And so you like speed up and then you do the same thing to them. Do you know what that is when we do that? <laughs> In either scenario, with the kids or with the adults, that is, here's what's behind that, that is... I have just experienced an injustice, and I will not stand for it. I mean, that is the heart of what's happening. And the root of all of this is it stems from this intrinsic belief in justice and a refusal to tolerate injustice. But we don't, don't we know this to be true, that retaliation and revenge rarely, if ever, solve conflict, nor uh, do they help us to love our enemies. And even God, I mean, God is a God of justice, and so we can say that justice is good, but because we are broken people, um, 
our outworking of justice can often lead to sin that's growing. It can often mean that conflict escalates. And so what Jesus is going to do today, he's going to enter the fray and he's going to teach us about getting revenge and loving our enemies. And so if you've got your Bible, would you please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to pick it up right where we left off a couple of weeks ago in verse 38. And so while you're turning there, you might remember uh, that we're in a series covering Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And when we last left off, uh, Jesus had just told his disciples that um, he had not come to get rid of the Old Testament. He, he says the law and the prophets. I didn't come to get rid of the law and the prophets, but, but really I came to fulfill them. And so what Jesus is just doing there is he's establishing his divine authority. And then after he makes that statement, what follows then are these six comparisons between external performance of the law and internal obedience to the law. And two weeks ago, we covered the first four of those six. We covered anger, lust, divorce, and the swearing of oaths. And uh, today we're going to cover the last two, revenge and hatred. And with each one of these issues, what Jesus is doing is he was calling his disciples then, and by extension, you and I, calls us to commit ourselves not just to obeying the external requirement of the law, but also making sure that we've addressed the internal issues of the heart. And in this first passage that we're going to cover in, in verses 38 through 42, um, this is the source of four very well-known sayings that almost anybody, whether you grew up in church or not, almost every one of us has used these phrases before, but not everyone has understood it before. And so those four phrases are, tell me by show of hands if you've heard this before, an eye for an eye. Yeah, you've heard that. How about this one? Turn the other cheek. Yeah. How about go the extra mile or go the second mile? Okay, you've heard that one, and here's the last one. Uh, give them the shirt off your back. Yeah, all four of those phrases are in these five verses that we see there. So let's take a look at what Jesus teaches about revenge and retaliation. This is Matthew 5, beginning in verse 38. It says, you've heard that it was said, so remember... Um, if we were to go back to a couple of weeks ago, because Jesus is talking about the law and the prophets, and he's saying he came to fulfill it, he's saying, you've heard that it was said, and when he, when he says that, he's referring back to the Old Testament. He's saying, you guys grew up uh, with the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament. Again, they called it the law and the prophets, and he's like, you grew up with the Scripture, so you've heard that it was said according to Scripture, and then Jesus pops in and says, but I say... So he says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And so it, what he's referring to there is an actual Old Testament policy that's found in the book of Leviticus. Um, it was a policy that was designed to prevent personal vendettas from uh, basically giving a punishment that was greater than what was deserved. In other words, I mean, we would say in our day and time, it's like the, the punishment should fit the crime. You, you, you know, whatever that crime is worth, it has a value. In fact, let me just read it to you. It's from Leviticus 24. It says this. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done it, shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. And so here is the thought behind this. It is, let's say you're out working in the field and, and you, I mean, this is kind of crude, but you had a, a shovel or a rake or a hoe and you, you've got the long stick end and, and, and you swing it back and you accidentally like hit somebody in the eye and it blinds them. Um, they're just saying you shouldn't be killed for that, All right? You, you should just suffer an equal punishment for that. And uh, it's interesting in that day and time, they didn't actually then take a shovel and say, okay, hey, this is going to hurt, lay down, you, <laughs> you poked his eye out, I'm going to poke your eye out. Um, they had what was called measured justice. And, and so body parts were worth a certain monetary value. So an eye was worth X and a finger was worth X. And so if you accidentally poke someone in the eye and it caused them to lose sight, you could just pay that financially. You didn't have to lose your own eye. But even if we stay 
within the bounds of reciprocal, like inflicting reciprocal pain, we're still missing the point because our external conformity and what Jesus is going after here um, demands justice and it's often masking an internal problem and that is we want revenge. And, And revenge is sin. And so Jesus says, look again, verse 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And then he says, verse 39, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. It's like Jesus understands the human condition, right? I mean, he knows that when we're hurt, what we want is we want payback. And Jesus says, don't fight back. And then starting right here in verse 39, he, he, he gives us four examples of this principle of answering evil or answering injustice with kindness and generosity. I mean, he's going after our hearts here. Take a look at this. Verse 39, he says, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay, in Jesus' day, um, getting struck or getting slapped on the right cheek was considered an insult. Okay, so you would take your right hand, if somebody was facing you, you would take your right hand and you would hit them with the back of your hand, and then so that would hit them in the right cheek. In fact, I need to demonstrate this. Don, will you come up here real quick? (laughs) I'm just kidding. It's still considered a terrible insult to this day, even over in the Middle East. Um, But let me clarify something, because this verse is often misunderstood. Um, This verse doesn't mean don't defend yourself. Um, It doesn't mean to ask for another hit, like, hey, is that all you got, you know? Just give me, that's not what this means. It means that if you're struck, if you're insulted, don't fight back. That's what it means. It's like, don't try to get even. I mean, Jesus is saying it would be better for you to receive a second blow, for you to be insulted again than to stoop down to the level of the person that's insulting you. That's what it means to turn the other cheek. Don't try to get even. In other words, I think Jesus is saying, hey, be kind and generous, even if someone verbally or physically insults you or assaults your person. The second example is in verse 40. He says, hey, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And so you're like, what does that mean? I don't remember the last time I wore a tunic. (laughs) So so your tunic was, was a shirt. I mean, it was basically the piece of clothing that was closest to your body. Um, and, and so back in Jesus' day, they, they didn't, you know, wear pants and socks and lace-up shoes, and, you know, they didn't look anything um, like us today and, and what we wear as far as modern-day clothing. And so your tunic was more like your shirt, and then you also had a, a cloak um, that was kind of like a parka or a blanket, and it's one of what you wore uh, on the outside. And, and so what they're saying here is, is that someone could sue you for your shirt Uh, But what was super interesting is that your cloak was actually protected by law. They couldn't take your cloak. They couldn't take your blanket. Uh, In our day and age, we wouldn't say that. We would say something more like, we'll sue the pants off of you. But again, they didn't wear pants. And so Jewish law permitted this. You could sue a person for their tunic. So once again, the idea is, is, is not that if you get unjustly sued that you shouldn't put up a defense It's not saying that you shouldn't go and hire an attorney or uh, that you should automatically give the plaintiff all that they're asking for and more. The idea here is that we shouldn't try to get even. It's like, don't countersue to get them back just to make them pay. I, I need a pound of flesh. In other words, Jesus is saying, be kind and generous even when someone unjustly cheats you. Cheats you out of your property. It's like if you're in the wrong, make a generous settlement. And if you're not in the wrong, put on an offense, but don't try and get revenge. Don't try to get even. Here's his third example, verse 41. He says, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. And so this is another interesting thing from back in Jesus' time. 
uh, at the time Jesus was living in Jerusalem and, and over uh, in those areas in which he traveled, uh, Rome was the occupying government at the time. And so they had this law, they had this policy um, that said if they were carrying luggage, let's say they'd been to Rodeo Drive and they'd been shopping and they got all kinds of shopping bags, um, that a, a Roman soldier or a government official could grab a citizen or uh, anybody, basically, and say, hey, you need to carry my bags. You need to carry my luggage. But the caveat to that was that you only had to carry it one mile. So thoughtful of them, right? (laughs) And so he's just saying, hey, like, man, when someone forces you to do something against your will, be kind. Be generous. Don't don't resent that. Now, now a quick point of clarification, too. This is addressing something legal, not illegal. And so this isn't if someone asks you to do something illegal. This is when someone asks you to do something um, legal. A nice practical example of, of that would be, like, how many of you like to pay taxes? Right? Don't you resent it? It's like if there's something that you're doing only because you have to do it, be careful. He's like, watch your heart. Because oftentimes what happens is we find subtle ways of resenting whatever it is that we're being asked to do. He says, do it gladly, and then on top of that, be generous. And in verse 42, he says, give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And it just feels like it's getting tougher, doesn't it? I mean, this is one of those verses that causes, I think, a lot of soul searching and and confusion. At face value, this seems to be saying that that we should give everyone or someone or anyone whatever they ask for. In fact, I'll make this even more unappealing because I think if if you were to maybe kind of consider what Jesus is saying here in, in context, it's probably talking about people who are taking advantage of your generosity. So it's like when you've been kind and generous to someone. But, but Jesus tells us, hey, man, if they've done that, continue to be generous to them. Like, don't, don't try to punish them from denying them help, right? I, 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 the common example for this would be like um, uh, panhandlers that are out on the street. I mean, so many of us pull up and you're like, ah, should I give them something? I don't know. They're probably not going to spend that money wisely. I think I'll just keep it to myself. I have the opportunity to bless them, but I'm not going to bless them because, well, I don't think that they'll do the right thing with it. And Jesus says, don't withhold your generosity. It's not up to you. They're going to do with it whatever they want to do. Your job is to be generous. Don't resent them. Don't hold that back. Be kind and generous even when somebody takes advantage of your generosity. And he's like, leave everything else to God. Then after tackling this idea of retaliation and revenge, Jesus takes it a step further and he starts talking to his disciples and to us about loving our enemies. Take a look. Verse 43, again, referring back to the law and the prophets, he says, well, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay, we got to call a time out and pause right here because before we go any further, I think it's important that we understand who is an enemy? Like, I, th- I think we sort of need to define that. An enemy can be lots of things. They can be somebody who hates us. Um, they can be somebody who seeks to harm us. They can be someone who um, seeks to just be a nuisance or cause us trouble. Uh, an enemy can be somewhat somebody who has um, wronged us. Our enemy can just be someone who's on the opposing side of things, right? Somebody who is unfriendly uh, in the sense that they're hostile to values or beliefs that are important to us. Um, I mean, there's lots of areas where we can find uh, enemies. And if you don't have any enemies, they're pretty easy to make because all you got to do is take like a strong view or a strong stance on something because surely someone else has the opposite opposing view. Uh, The meaning of enemy that comes to mind most easily for me is I think of enemy nations. Uh, People who, as Americans, people who would oppose our values for whatever their reasons are. 
um, they oppose us. Um, they think we're maybe infringing upon their interests, or we think that they're infringing upon our interests. We can also find enemies here at home, right? We've got political enemies, religious enemies, people who don't value the things that we value, people who don't believe the things that we believe. Maybe you have an enemy in business. Maybe you have a rival for someone else's affections. Like there's all kinds of areas where we can have enemies. Um, we can have personal enemies. People who have just like wronged us individually. People who hate us. And here's the natural thing to do. The natural thing to do is to hate them back. Like, that's what feels most natural. But Jesus has a different approach. Instead of a love or hate um, relationship, Jesus demands a love for hate relationship. Look, verse 44, he says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, so whoever they are, Whoever our enemies are, the correct way to respond to your enemy is not to hate them, but to love them. Again, not natural. That's supernatural. I mean, it's, it's a response. I mean, if you just read this, it is a response that is so unnatural to us that the only way that we're going to be able to follow this is through prayer. Like by asking God to change us. Through prayer. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus tells us to, to pray for our enemies, even those who persecute us? But, but here's why I think he tells us to pray for them, because it's prayer that changes us. It's prayer that changes our hearts. It's prayer that moves us from the natural response of hate to the supernatural response of love. And here's why. I do not have what it takes to love my enemies. But God does. And so instead of asking who is not worthy of your love, God's asking here, who do you love who's not worthy? I mean, th this should sting us. I'm just going to tell you, you can tell a lot about uh, a person and who they follow by the people that they love. It's a love for hate relationship. And, and, then, and then it's like, okay, so we know who our enemy is, but then what does it really mean to love them? Isn't that your natural response? Okay, you told me you had to love them. Now, define love for me. I mean, these days, love often gets associated with a feeling, right? I mean, we just throw that word out there like it's not a big deal. Like, I love tacos, or I love brisket, or I love ice cream. Apparently, I just love lots of food. I don't know. All my illustrations have to do with food. I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> but love in the Bible goes well beyond just a feeling, Right? I mean, it's really all about a decision. It's a choice that we make. And oftentimes, it's a, it, it, it's a decision to do something the opposite of, of what we feel like doing. And an example of this, an illustration, parents, you, you'll know this, parents especially that have uh, younger kids who've experienced the, you know, like the ages of like three to nine or 10 or whatever. Um, here's a scenario for you. Because if it hasn't happened yet to you, this will happen to you. Um, Toby Palmer, I'm looking at you. Um, and, and so it'll be a scenario like this. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and, the na and here's what happens. Um, all of a sudden, you feel this little tap on the shoulder. It's like, Mom, Dad, I just threw up. <laughs> and so what do you do? You get up. Um, you go assess the situation. You clean the child up, you uh, help them change clothes if they got it on them, you change the sheets uh, in the bed, uh, you attend to them, uh, you, you try to get their stomach to calm down, and you soothe them 
uh, to, to put them back to sleep? Did you feel like doing that at 3 a.m.? No. But, but you do it because you love your child, right? I mean, we understand this example because it's natural for us to love, you know, our own child, our family. It's not, however, natural to love our enemy. But the key word here is love. I mean, we're to love in both circumstances. We're to love our family. Uh, we're to love our enemies. In, in other words, it's kind of like, it means having an enough concern for another person's well-being that regardless of how they feel about you or you feel about them, you're still willing to attend to their needs. That, that's kind of what he's talking about here. And then if we just continue this train of thought, you're like, why? Why should we love our enemies? I mean, we know what an enemy is. We know what it means to love them. Why should we do this? Because if we're going to pursue something that's contrary to our nature and to our desires, we ought to have a good reason for doing so. And as he always does, Jesus tells us. He tells us why we need to love our enemies. Look at verse 45. He says, so, so that you may be sons or daughters, Children would probably be a better word, so that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. There's only one reason to love your enemies, because that's exactly what your Father in heaven would do. That's it. That's why you should do it. I mean, that's just the way that God treats our enemies, right? I mean, when we love our enemies, we demonstrate that we are God's children, is what Jesus said. Because unlike God, we love, we love in reciprocal human relationships, don't we? It's kind of like, hey man, you do something for me, uh, that shows me that, that you love me, and, and then I will do something for you. I, I, I mean, it's this give and take sort of reciprocal thing that we've got going on. Our love is given in return for something else. You love me, I'll love you back. But Jesus says anyone can do that. Look, verse 46, he says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? It's like we're not handing out gold stars if you like the people that like you. You don't get a pat on the back for that. You love your wife? No reward. You're supposed to do that. It says, do not even the tax collectors do the same? Like in Jesus' day, a tax collector was a low life. Uh, man, what's, I got to keep it clean in here. They were despised human beings. That's what a tax collector was. I mean, for one thing, again, we've already mentioned it, nobody likes to pay taxes. Uh, in addition, tax collectors were considered traitors. I mean, they were Jewish agents for the occupying Roman government. When they went out and collected taxes, the way that they made money, the way that they made a living was, is they assessed a tax value greater than what they were supposed to assess. And they kept the difference. And so if you were supposed to pay a 10% tax on donkeys sold, then they, you know, jacked that up to 11% or 12% and kept the difference. Um, they were legal crooks. And yet, however slimy these dudes were, you know what? They liked each other. They loved each other. There's nothing special about loving somebody who loves you. Jesus says, even a low-life, traitorous, despised human being can do that. And then Jesus doubles down, verse 47. He's like, and if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? I feel like that's a churchy word. Whenever we say Gentiles, we just mean someone like in our day and age who's a non-believer. 
Uh, they they uh, had their own religious beliefs. And so Jesus is like, so even if they have other religious beliefs and they don't believe in Yahweh, God, um, that didn't keep them from being unfriendly with each other. So the question is, if they can do that without having a relationship with God, what can you do with a relationship with God? In essence, Jesus is saying, since you do know God, you can do better. You can do better than this. You're capable of more. You can be kind to both your friends and your enemies. And you can love people the way that God loves them. I mean, this is just the heart of the whole matter. That Jesus is going after our heart. He's like, do you indiscriminately love people the way that God loves them? Do you love without distinction? the way that God loves people? Do you love based on grace the way that God loves? Again, the kind of people you love shows who you're following. And then Jesus closes out this section, verse 48. Um, he says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, that was not necessary, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, this verse causes a lot of headaches, doesn't it? Because just taken just by itself and out of context, it, it, it sounds like Jesus is setting a standard here we can't possibly attain. He's like, be perfect? Are you kidding me? But in context, Jesus is talking about the way that we ought to love. Loving only our friends and our families in incomplete love, anybody can do it. He's like, you need to do more than that. You got to love your enemy. You have to love those who hate you. You have to love those who hate God. Because that kind of love is mature and fully developed. And that's the kind of love that our Heavenly Father has towards us. Our love should be like God's love. We should follow our Heavenly Father's example. And so as we wrap this up today, just let me ask you, how is your capacity to love today? Like Jesus, I'm not asking you, do you love those who love you? Because apparently anybody can do that. question is, is your capacity to love great enough that you can love your enemies? My prayer for you, my prayer for myself and for our church family is that God might supernaturally increase our capacity to both love him and to love our enemies. Amen. Amen. At Fellowship Bible, we have a rhythm of receiving communion on the first Sunday of the month. And so I'm going to ask the servers if they would uh, begin to prepare the elements. They're going to head to the back of the room and begin taking their stations around uh, the room with the bread and the cup. And so while they're doing that, I want to give you just a moment um, to reflect uh, as they're doing that. Uh, to just wherever you're seated in the worship center today, to just take the next few minutes as James begins to play, to just meditate and reflect um, before we participate in the Lord's Supper together.
Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10. He wrote, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And so I'm going to ask the ushers if they would begin to pass the elements. And if you would, once you receive them, if you'll just hang on to them. We'll all take them together here in just a moment. If you're here today and you haven't stepped into a personal relationship with Jesus, you can't honestly, wherever you're seated, say that he is your Lord and Savior. We would just kindly ask that you let the elements pass by you. Um, This is something that we do um, to remember him. As we practice communion, uh, we are remembering Jesus Christ, who suffered death upon the cross for our redemption, and who by his sacrifice offered once and for all the perfect payment for sin for all of those in the world. So in light of this, uh, we come now to the table. Um, in obedience uh, to God's word, Um, kind of in lasting, perpetual memory until Jesus comes again. And so on the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And in like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he began to pass that cup, and he said, uh, drink of this, all of you. Uh, this is my blood, which is shared for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to remember you in both the bread and the cup. And today, as we take it, may it be a lasting reminder to us, Jesus, that while you were here on earth, both fully uh, God and fully man, that you showed us what it meant to live a life that wasn't filled with anger, a life that didn't lust after the things of this world. that didn't seek retaliation or revenge, but that went much deeper than that. That even while you're hanging there on a cross, you're like, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. What a love for enemy. May we be people who conform to that type of character your character. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a beautiful day in God's house today. Um, I'm going to ask you as we dismiss here in a minute, if you would not crunch your cups, but take them with you. Um, uh, I know no adults were doing that, right? That's right. Um, and if you're here this morning, and maybe the message, um, maybe the Holy Spirit was just uh, moving you, and as you were seated here today, you thought, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm hanging on to some anger, I'm hanging on to some revenge, I'm hanging on to some retaliation. We have some people on our prayer team that would love nothing more than to spend a few minutes after the service praying with you, and so as we stand, our prayer team's going to come forward. Would you stand with me as we say our benediction together? Also, I want to remind you that Creative Night is tonight. Uh, college students, uh, I'm talking to you. We should see some of you uh, here tonight. One of the best decisions I made when I went off to Hardin-Simmons University in 1987 whoa, um, <laughs> was finding a church and joining it. It transformed me way more than my degree ever did. Uh, and so I just want to encourage you to do uh, the same and then also enjoy the, the free lunch after church today. We're having a young adults lunch too. So anyway, Thank you for being here today. Let's read our benediction together. The words are on the screen. Father, help us to love the weak to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. Amen.